So let's today talk about how viruses cause disease. And if you don't like molecular biology, this is for you. It's a little, most people find this part of the course a little easier and a little more interesting. It's fine. And we're going to start today with a basic discussion of how things get infected. And here is my, one of my favorite quotes. You notice on all these lectures I have a quote which kind of embodies the lecture. And Rico Fermi, before I came here I was confused about this subject. Having heard your lecture, I am still confused but at a higher level. <laughs> That's my goal here. We have so far talked about viruses infecting plates of cells, cells in a petri dish. To, for the rest of the course we're going to talk about viruses infecting uh, organisms. This is a human-centric course, so it's mostly going to be humans, uh, but we'll, we'll throw in some plants and bacteria as well. End goals are slightly different, because in a dish in the lab, that's the end for the virus. It's not going anywhere. But in a population, the virus has to establish itself to endure, otherwise it's gone. And I'm sure over the years, many viruses have come and gone, and we just don't know about them, just like many species have gone extinct. But those we see today are the ones that are enduring. And the goal, however, for cells and culture and for an organism, a multicellular organism, is the same in the bottom there. They have to get in and they have to get out. Viruses have to get in to replicate. And then if they're going to endure in the population, they have to get out and spread to another host. And we'll talk about that today. On day one, I said to you, we live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. And it turns out that most of the infections have no consequence for many of the reasons we talked about earlier. Uh, and today we'll introduce this concept of the inapparent infection. Most of us are infected. And in fact, viruses are replicating in us. They're not just passing through in the coast law. They are replicating in us, but we, we don't feel anything. It's called an inapparent infection. And I want to give an example there are many, many examples of this. In fact, few are the viruses for which there are no inapparent infections. This is West Nile virus. This is a flavivirus transmitted by mosquitoes, which didn't exist in the US before 1999. So it's a great opportunity to study the introduction and spread of a new virus. 1999, it arrived in Queens, New York City, people started getting sick there, and birds in the Bronx Zoo were also dying because this virus infects both birds and people. And so if you look at the prevalence of West Nile virus, which we can tell by taking serum from people, give me some blood, I will take the serum part, and I will look for antibodies against the virus. It's what we call a serological survey. We could tell that by October, 2004, a million people were already infected. 1999 drives in New York State, and then it begins to slowly spread every year after that. And now it's gone across the US, it's in every state, it's in North and South America as well. About 20% of infected people got a fever, and the rest, nothing. They said, no, I don't remember being sick. Of course, they don't remember being bitten by a mosquito either, but they had no fever, yet they had antibodies to the virus. That's an inapparent infection. Of these 20% who are infected, about 1% get what we call neuroinvasive illness. The virus gets into their brain or spinal cord and causes problems. We'll talk about that later. So many people were infected without having any obvious disease. This has practical consequences because it makes it really hard to stop an epidemic if you can't see uh, where it's spreading. And time and time again throughout history, this has been a problem for us because we haven't been able to stop uh, epidemics because there are so many uninfected people or infected people who are inapparently infected. And we will discuss a few specific examples of that. Now what we'll talk about for the rest of this course it deals with what I call viral pathogenesis. So pathogenesis, that word alone, 
is the process of producing a disease. It can be bacterial pathogenesis. It can be a chemical or neurotoxin that causes disease, just the process of causing disease. And of course, here we're talking about viral disease. And always, there are two components to viral pathogenesis. There is what the virus does to the host. The virus is replicating in us. It is causing direct effects on our cells, and that's part of pathogenesis, killing cells, a virus that kills neurons in your brain. That's part of the paralysis. But then there's also the effect of the host. The host responds vigorously, often, with an immune response, and that's meant to curtail virus infection. But it also has consequences, because those of you who have taken immunology know that immune responses can cause damage. And it turns out, as we'll see, much of the pathogenesis of many viruses is entirely immunological. The virus is actually not doing anything. So it's always a mixture, and you always have to remember that. I have studied viral pathogenesis my entire career. I'm interested in how viruses cause disease. These are some of the questions that people like me study. How does the virus get into the host? We'll talk about that today. What, what is the initial host response? We'll talk about that on Wednesday. Where does the virus replicate initially? Primary replication site. How does the virus spread? Uh, when it does spread, what organs and tissues are infected? Is it cleared? Is the infection cleared? Or does it last your lifetime? Like all of you have some sort of herpes virus in you, which you're never going to get rid of. You got it early in your life, and you keep it forever. We're going to talk about how that works. And, and finally, how, how the virus is transmitted. These are actually just some questions. There are many others as well, and we'll touch on others in this course. So a successful infection in a human, there are three requirements. First, you have to be hit with enough virus. Most viruses, if you inhale one PFU, it's not likely to infect you, start an infection. Many reasons, one being the particle to PFU ratio being so high, it may not be an infectious particle. So you need enough virus, and that differs according to the virus we're talking about. The cells that are initially the virus are, is coming to have to be accessible. If they're hidden, they can't be infected. They have to be both susceptible, have receptors, and be permissive. They have to be able to replicate the virus. And the antiviral defense is either not there or it has to be overcome. So let's talk about getting in to a host, gaining access to a host. We actually have a limited spectrum of entry sites for virus infection. They're all shown on this picture here, and they include our mucosal surfaces, respiratory, alimentary, and, and others, our skin, uh, and uh, the eyes, mouth, and nose. So it's pretty restricted. So let's go through some of these and talk about how they work. First is the skin. The biggest organ in your body is your skin. And it is a great defense against virus infection. Here's a little cross section of the skin on the left here. The epidermis is the outer layer. The top layer of the epidermis is dead. It's dead. Viruses cannot infect it. It's a brilliant strategy. The viruses land on your skin. If your skin is not broken, they will not be able to infect because this, the cells are dead and they can't replicate in them. So that's a great defense lining your entire skin. Of course, many of us have broken skin and so viruses can get in that way. Mosquitoes, of course, go past the dead layers of the upper skin. Their proboscis goes into the very highly vascularized dermis. So if we go back to our skin, we have our epidermis. The top layers are dead. Then below that, we have some live cells, but not many blood vessels in it. And then below it, the dermis, highly vascularized with all sorts of cells. And that's where the mosquito is going here on the right. The mosquito, and this is a female mosquito always. Only the females take blood meals. Males drink sap. Uh, they just drink uh, sugar water, basically. But the females need blood when they have to lay eggs. They need uh, blood components for that. So they are the ones biting you. And they're looking for a capillary to insert their proboscis in. Um, and as they're probing, I have a video here. Check that out. Of 
a, vi a mosquito probing a piece of mouse skin, and it's so scary because this mosquito is probing, looking for capillaries. And as it's doing this, its proboscis is leaking saliva because saliva contains an anticoagulant to keep the blood flowing and a painkiller. So you don't feel the mosquito and you don't slap it, right? So this, this, this mosquito is depositing all these chemicals. And of course, if it has virus in it, it's depositing those along with it. That's why you get infected. And eventually the mosquito will find a capillary and put proboscis in it. And it's amazing, the, um, the suction on this video, it collapses the entire capillary as it's pulling the blood out. So that's in the, the highly vascularized dermis. And then below that is our subcutaneous fat which I've ignored mostly my entire career. And I just went to a meeting in Iowa last week, and I learned that this is probably one of the places that Ebola virus replicates in, these fat cells beneath uh, the dermis, which is really remarkable because many people transmit Ebola by touching someone else. So it could be the virus is replicating here and leaking upwards. So the skin is a great defense, but if you can get past it as a mosquito does, a dog biting you or anything biting you, a needle stick in a hospital, a scratch, any of those things can breach the very fragile outer layer. So it's a great protection, but there are easy ways to get past it. Okay, skin. Uh, next, we have mucosal surfaces. These are ripe for infection. So, so we have this wonderful skin covering us, but unfortunately we have to uh, respire, we have to take in gases, and we have to get rid of things. And for that, we need mucosal surfaces. And we have lots of them. We have... Uh, the conjunctiva, our eyes, the mouth and the nose. We have the respiratory tract, uh, the alimentary tract, and urogenital tract. So these are all lined with living cells pretty much exposed to the environment, and they're ripe for getting infected. They have some protections, as we will see, but they're highly vulnerable. And so, in fact, most viral infections occur through mucosal surfaces. So let's look at some of these in some detail. Uh, we have our respiratory tract. This is perfect. Not only is it lined with mucosal cells and it's wet, it's a lovely wet surface covered with mucus, but we're breathing six liters of air a minute. We are sampling all the viruses floating around <coughs> constantly. We're breathing in and they're going down there and we're breathing out. It's amazing that we don't get ill more often. Again, we have great defenses and many of the viruses we breathe in don't matter. So our respiratory tract upper, middle and lower, of course, is lined with ciliated cells and interspersed with other kinds of cells, like goblet cells that make the mucus that cover the brush border. And these cells are exposed to the air on one side, the apical domain, and the basal lateral domain has a pretty good membrane below it, a basement membrane is called. It's really a, a collection of uh, high molecular weight proteins and carbohydrates. And that prevents things from getting past the cells. And we'll see how to breach that in a moment. Because once you get past them, you can become uh, systemic and get into the circulation and spread elsewhere. And so this kind of construction uh, is similar throughout the respiratory tract. Viruses can infect the upper tract and stay there. So there are lots of viruses that cause these clinical manifestations of upper tract infection, like rhinitis, pharyngitis, or laryngitis. And See some of the viruses there on the right. And many viruses can spread below to lower parts of the tract, the trachea, the bronchi, and even the alveoli. If you get all the way down there and you replicate and cause damage, that's pneumonia. And lots of viruses can do that as well. So this is a prime site for getting infection. And of course, we all know that because we get common colds. And in the winter, we get uh, influenza and so forth. Uh, we'll come back to the respiratory tract often uh, in subsequent discussions. And we have the alimentary tract. This is another good site because it's not only lined with a mucosal surface with cells, but we are often in inserting things into it like food, right? And drinks that may be contaminated. Uh, and so it's also lined with uh, uh, the same kinds of cells. So let's take a look at that. Uh, here we have an intestinal surface on the upper Oh, let's start on the lower left. We have an epithelial cell sheet, uh, and this happens to be the small intestine, so it's arranged as villi. 
Epithelial cell sheet, of course, is open to the lumen of the gut, and anything you're eating is passing over these and able to infect them. And below that, we have uh, connective tissue, muscle, and so forth. And there, there are also uh, membrane barriers on the bottom. So if we take a look at uh, some of these epithelial cells in the expanded view on top, you'll see two cells. And in the intestine, we call them enterocytes because they're specialized, but these are uh, epithelial cells with microvilli on their surfaces. And you can see below is a basement membrane similar to the one I showed you in the respiratory tract. And again, that protects uh, the system from things easily getting from the apical side to the circulation below. Interspersed throughout the small intestine are what we call M cells, M for microfold. These cells are important to sample the antigen contents of the lumen. They grab them and uh, bring them below for sampling. Often dendritic cells stick out their processes into the gut lumen via these M cells. You can see here some lymphocytes and macrophages that may respond to foreign antigens. And on this electron micrograph, you can see an M cell here, and on either side is an enterocyte. And some viruses actually take advantage of the fact that M cells are, are often sampling the lumen by a process called transcytosis. Things bind on the surface of the M cell, they're taken into the uh, cell by endocytosis is then released on the bottom to get in. And here we have some real virus particles, the small ones shown by arrows that are going to cross into the underlying tissues via these M cells. But not all viruses do that. Many also infect the enterocytes, uh, as we will see. So again, the gut is a good place to get infected because it's open. The cells have access to the lumen. And we introduce food and drink into that area that may carry viruses with it, like coleslaw, full of insect viruses, which fortunately aren't able to replicate in here. But um, you could eat something that's contaminated with a norovirus and get gastroenteritis as viruses replicating in some of these cells. Your genital tract, another mucosal surface that is susceptible to infection. It has some protections. Uh, often sexual activity causes abrasions, microabrasions that allow viruses to enter. And some viruses make local lesions, like the human papillomaviruses that cause warts. They may make local lesions. We'll, we'll come back to those later when we talk about vaccines and cancers. Uh, and some of the viruses that enter in this, this area, uh, HIV and herpes simplex viruses, can spread from that initial site of infection. Then we have the eye, which is a, uh, a site of infection as well. It has mucosal membranes on it, the conjunctival membranes here. Conjunctival epithelial cells, you can see they go from your eyelid to covering uh, the, the front surface of the eye. They can be infected with a number of viruses. And if you've ever seen someone with an eye looking like that, that's a subconjunctival bleed. It can be caused by adenoviruses. Very common, you go swimming somewhere where the pool has not been properly sanitized, so there are lots of viruses in it. They can infect your eye, and a number of viruses can do that. But you can see there are other cells that can be infected, corneal stromal fibroblasts, corneal epithelial cells. Uh, even the retinal pigment ep epithelial cells can be infected uh, with viruses. A fetus we shouldn't forget about. The fetus can specifically be infected with a variety of viruses in two ways. First, we can get transplacental infection. So sometime during gestation, a virus will cross the placenta from the maternal circulation, enter fetal circulation, replicate in the fetus. And we have a name for the viruses that can cause congenital birth defects or damages by infection uh, and crossing the placenta. They're called the torch pathogen, and that stands for toxoplasma, rubella, cytomegalovirus, HIV, and other. And a new other is Zika virus, which was recently found to be a torch pathogen. So HIV does not cross the placenta. It's crossing perinatally during birth, when there's a lot of blood present and the blood in the mother has HIV in it, that it will infect the child. And uh, that's why we will give mothers before birth antivirals for HIV to bring the viral load down and prevent. It absolutely works. If you are treated before birth, you will not transmit perinatally. 
So that's the other way we can get transmission, not transplacentally, but during birth when there's a lot of blood present and the, the baby is, is covered in blood and will get infected. First question is, outer layer of which of the following is dead but can still serve as a portal of entry, respiratory tract, elementary tract, eye, skin, or urogenital tract? Almost 100%, 96% said skin, which of course is right. The outer uh, layer of skin is dead. If uh, the outer layer of your respiratory or urogenital tract is dead, I'm, I think you have some problems. You should see a physician. <laughs> they're not dead. They're very much alive. And that's why mucosal surfaces are so vulnerable, because they have this layer of live cells on top of them. Those are ways that viruses get into us. Not a lot, right? But they're, they're there, and they're, they provide a good target. Now let's talk about viruses spreading from those primary sites of infection. So many viruses never spread, they remain localized. So here we have a respiratory epithelium that gets infected with, say, a rhinovirus. The virus is produced in the infected cells and, and simply spreads from cell to cell, but never goes beyond the basement membrane. So we call those localized infections. Uh, they can be nasty. Uh, influenza viruses remain localized, uh, and they're, they're quite nasty. But others can spread. And if viruses spread beyond the primary site, so that primary site is where the virus comes in and initially infects. If it spreads beyond that, we say it is disseminated. And if it infects many organs, we call it a systemic infection, two different terms. And for viruses to get past these initial cells, because in most cases, there's a basement membrane or some kind of restriction of virus, so the viruses have to actively do something to get beyond this basement membrane. So let's talk a little bit about how that happens. So here I mentioned already the M cell can be a portal of entry. Uh, these cells, these, these macrophages and lymphocytes, have a way to get through the basement membrane to be right up against the M cell and then leave so viruses can hitch a ride with them as well. But more often, uh, virus infection of these enterocytes causes an immune response, which recruits cytokines to the infection. You get inflammation, and that can break down the basement membrane itself. So an indirect consequence of virus infection, the immune response will break down the basement membrane and allow viruses to pass from the epithelium to the underlying tissues. And again, not every virus does that, so it must depend on both the virus and the immune response. Another consideration is the polarity of these epithelial cells. They have an apical and a basal lateral domain that are chemically very different. And the apical domain, of course, let's go back to this slide. The apical side is exposed to the environment. In this case, this is the gut, so that would be the lumen of the gut. If it's the respiratory tract, it would be the air in the lumen. The basal lateral domain is just above the basement membrane. Some viruses are released just from the apical domain. Some are released from the basal lateral, and some are released from both. You can imagine that a virus that is only released at the apical domain is less likely to spread, to become systemic, because it can't get to the underlying tissues. And so here are some examples of that top. We have influenza viruses, which are budding from the apical domain of these cells, and that, that puts them in the lumen of the respiratory tract. So as you exhale or cough or sneeze, the viruses come spread to another host. Measles virus, same thing, comes off the apical domain of the respiratory epithelium. But here on the bottom is an example of a virus, VSV, which can come off the basal lateral domain and therefore has the, at least the potential to get past the basement membrane. It also still has to be compromised, that basement membrane. But if the virus is not released from the <coughs> bottom of the cells, very unlikely that it's going to spread systemically. So here's an example I want to tell you about. Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus, so it's in the same family as measles virus, but it's a mouse virus, so we do experiments in mice. You take Sendai virus and you uh, instill it into the respiratory tract of mice, they get a respiratory infection, which is cleared, but it remains localized to the respiratory tract. Some years ago, investigators made a virus mutant. They made a one amino acid change in the viral like a protein, that now gave the virus the new property of being able to be shed from the basal lateral domain. So the 
Wild type Sendai virus is only shed from the apical domain, and in mice remains restricted to the respiratory tract. If you make a mutant that can now be released basal laterally, when you infect mice with that, they get a systemic infection. So it's a great example of how being released at the basal lateral domain is important for systemic spread. Once the virus gets beyond that uh, epithelial sheet in the basement membrane, then it has access to many, many other places. So here again is our epithelium at the body surface. Could be any of these mucosal sites. Basement membrane, we've breached it, again, by inflammation. The virus is now in what we call a sub-epithelial spaces, and they're full of capillaries of all sorts, lymph capillaries and blood capillaries. And here's a lymphatic capillary. They tend to be more permeable than blood capillaries, so viruses can get into them quite readily. And of course, once you're in the lymph system, you can go through a lymph node and get back into or get into the circulation. So a virus can now spread anywhere. Once it's in the circulatory system, uh, it can go to any tissues, right? Because they supply everywhere. And so that's the way many viruses can <laughs> spread. The virus in the blood is called a viremia. It's a very specific term, viremia, virus in the blood. And here's a graph of an experiment in mice where they're inoculated with virus, and then we're measuring uh, virus in the blood at different days after infection. So we inoculate the virus and we sample the blood specifically. And in initially you see this spike of virus that's passive viremia. It's what we put in. It's what the mice were inoculated with. And that eventually goes down. It was spreads to tissues at the inoculation site. And then you have what we call a primary viremia. The virus is replicating in those initial sites of replication. Uh, and virus is released, and that gives you the primary viremia. And then, typically, the primary viremia seeds virus to more distant sites. And it amplifies the infection. And now you have a very high burst of virus a little bit later than the primary. We call that a secondary viremia. It's secondary because those sites are typically distant from the initial site of infection. And uh, th those sites depend on being inf infected by virus produced from the primary viremia. So this is obviously important for pathogenesis, for viruses getting around the body. But it's also important for the blood supply because we still haven't figured out how to make synthetic blood, so we still get <coughs> blood from donors. And it's a, it's a typical way of spreading virus infections. Before we knew about HIV, we were spreading it in the blood supply. All the hepatitis viruses, A, B, C, D, E, G, we skipped F, I don't know why, all discovered from the blood supply. You, you find one, you find A, and then you check the blood supply for A, and then, oh, people are still getting hepatitis. Oh, it's B. It probably wasn't in that order, but you get the picture. We find viruses in the blood supply because we have to get blood from people. Right now, the blood is tested for quite a few viruses. But here's a dirty secret. If we threw away any pint of blood that was virus positive, we would have no blood supply because every pint of blood that's donated is full of virus of some sort. But unless we're sure it causes a disease, we're okay giving it to people. So when, when you get blood, you're getting circle viruses or anelovirus. You're not getting HIV or HBV or, or hep C. We test for all of those. But there are lots of other viruses uh, that we don't test for, that we don't reject the blood supply for. All right, so let's put some of this together now. This is an animal model of smallpox called mousepox. It's a similar virus, same family of pox virus, and you can study it in mice. You start by uh, in, infecting the mice in the foot pad. So here, here's the foot of, these, <laughs> of the mouse, and you, you put it in the foot pad because that's how the virus is spread in nature. As mice are walking on the forest floor, there are little cracks in their foot pads, and other mice have shed virus. They step on it, and it gets inoculated. So it's a good way to inoculate mice. Uh, the virus replicates uh, locally in the skin cells in the foot pad, and then gets beyond the epithelial layer and invades the lymph node. That's uh, here, that, that green is the lymph node and the lymph system. It gets into the blood, primary viremia. 
made by replication at that primary site of inoculation, primary viremia. The vi primary viremia brings virus to the spleen and the liver. It re replicates there. The virus comes back out. You have a secondary viremia. So this is what I was telling you, the primary near the site of inoculation. That seeds more distant organs, you get a secondary viremia. And then after that, the virus uh, homes in on the skin and you get lesions, as you can see, developing in these mice here early and later in infection. So from a foot pad inoculation, the virus gets in the blood, spreads systemically and eventually to the skin. But that's not the only place the virus is. It's in other organs as well. And uh, the foot is swelling as a consequence of an immune response. You can see it's getting bigger and bigger because that's where we have put the virus in. So this kind of work actually establishes the paradigm for our understanding of a lot of human infections. As we'll see later, many human infections start by virus coming in, causing a viremia, and spreading to whatever the target organ might be. Now, many viruses do target the skin or go to the skin as part of this viremic phase, and they can produce lots of skin rashes. And this table is just a, it's not comprehensive, just to give you some example of different viruses and the, the disease that they're involved with and the, the rashes that you can see associated with the disease. This is not, the rash is not the only manifestation of these infections, but it is a characteristic one. And you can see I have different names. I have maculopapular rashes, like this on the left is a maculopapular rash. It's obviously red, and there are immune reactions going on there. It's not just virus replicating and making a red rash. It's our immune response. But these tend to be flattened as opposed to a vesicular rash on the right here, which is raised and looks like a vesicle. And here are some of the rashes caused by measles. And uh, this, this is all over the body in a kid with measles. Smallpox, terribly scarring rashes. You'll never get rid of the scars after that if you survive. And there is a chickenpox rash, you can see. So they all have characteristic features besides being uh, maculopapular or vesicular, where they are in the body, and so forth. All right, next question. In general, a secondary viremia is a consequence of which of the following? A, viral replication in the bloodstream. B, replication at the original site of entry. C, replication at organs distal to the site of entry. D, apical release from polarized cells, all of the above. So the answer is C, uh, viral replication in organs distal to the site of entry, that's the definition I gave to you. Some of you got that. Uh, others said all, so let's see why it's not all. Replication in the bloodstream. It could, but I didn't actually tell you that that's how it results. It usually results from replication in a tissue. Say the site of entry, the epithelial cells, and that virus gets into the blood. So there are certainly examples of viruses that will replicate in immune cells in the blood and cause a viremia, but it's not the only way. So that's why it wouldn't be right in general. At the site of entry, that would be the primary viremia caused by virus replication at the site of entry. And then we spread somewhere else, and then you get the secondary infection. So hopefully that clears it up. I just want you to understand the difference between primary and secondary viremias. Virus can also spread along nerve pathways. We call this neural spread. Uh, as you know, we have both sensory and motor nerve endings in the periphery, and these are wired to the spinal cord and eventually to the brain. And viruses can enter nerve endings, either sensory nerve endings or uh, nerve endings in muscle, two different kinds, of course, and they can travel uh, up to the neurons that are innervated by those endings, and they can replicate in those neurons. Some viruses can actually travel the other way, come out, as we will see uh, with herpes viruses. They go in through sensory nerve endings and reside in a ganglion, which is a collection of neurons outside of the central nervous system. So when I say central nervous system, I mean the spinal cord and the brain. And peripheral nervous system is any nerve collection of nerves or nerve uh, cells outside of it. And so some viruses can go in and come out as well. And the, the way viruses travel in nerves uh, is illustrated on the top right. Here we have a, a neuron cell body and a, a synaptic terminus. So you have uh, axons and dendrites in between. And 
uh, viruses travel along the, the microtubules that are within these projections. And here's a blow up in the middle of microtubules and there are different kinds of motors uh, depending on which way the traveling is going, but viruses uh, can attach to these motor proteins like dynein and be transported one way or the other. So they can enter a nerve ending and be transported up to the nerve cell body by these kinds of mechanisms. Uh, this travel has been taken advantage of to try and map circuits in the brain. And you can take a variety of viruses. You can take a rabies virus or herpes simplex viruses or others, and you can put a green fluorescent protein gene in them, and then you inoculate the virus in a very specific part of the brain, and you see where it goes. And you can trace the wiring that way. It's a beautiful way to do this. And here's an example of that where a herpes virus labeled with GFP has been inoculated down at the lower right, and it's traveled through the whole network to its end. So you can actually map all the interacting, all the synapses that have formed during development, which otherwise is very hard to do. But in terms of disease, obviously this contributes to viruses spreading. Now when we talk about viruses infecting the central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord, we have specific terms, and I want you to understand them so you know what I mean. So I'll, I'll talk about neurotropic viruses. What that means is that the virus can infect neural cells. And we typically mean uh, neurons and astrocytes as the main types of neural cells that are infected. And it doesn't matter how the virus gets there, it is, if it can replicate in the neural cells, it's neurotropic. A neuroinvasive virus can get into the central nervous system after peripheral inoculation. So let's say I inoculate the foot pad of a mouse with a virus, it gets in the brain of the mouse, that's a neuroinvasive virus. That's all it means, it gets into the brain from a peripheral site. A neurovirulent virus can cause disease of nervous tissue. So a neurovirulent virus typically has to be neurotropic, it need not be neuroinvasive, it could get in uh, by other means. So let's look at a couple of examples. We have herpes simplex viruses. These are typically not terribly neuroinvasive. They reside in peripheral ganglia, so we're talking about invading the central nervous system here. But if they do get into the CNS, they are very neurovirulent once they, once they get there. And so herpes simplex viruses, as we'll see later, are typically maintained in the cycle between sensory nerve endings and peripheral ganglia. But sometimes something wrong happens, the virus goes into the brain, and then it can be very serious. Herpes encephalitis is a very serious disease. Uh, mumps virus. Mumps is a virus that, in my youth, infected every kid until the vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine was developed, which pretty much eliminated, except in the people who choose not to be vaccinated and cause outbreaks in the rest of the population, of course. But mumps is highly neuroinvasive. And some studies that were done in kids who got mumps pre-vaccine, about half of them had virus in the brain. But they were fine because it has low neurovirulence. Quite remarkable, actually, that the virus could get in the brain and not really cause damage. And finally, rabies. That's really the worst. It's highly neuroinvasive and highly neurovirulent. So if you're bitten by a rabid dog on your hand, you're pretty much guaranteed that the virus will eventually get into your brain. It will take time, it will take a few weeks to travel up the nerve from your hand. And in fact, if you're bitten on the face, you have less time because the face is closer to the brain uh, than your hand. But it will invade your CNS, and once it's there, it will damage your nerve cells. Rabies is 100% fatal in the absence of any prophylaxis. So that's why we immunize, we can immunize after a rabies bite because it takes so long for the virus uh, to get into the CNS. But if you don't, barely anyone has survived a rabies, a bite by a rabid animal without some kind of intervention. All right, so we're spreading from the initial site by either the blood or nerves. How do you get into other tissues? This is all about tissue invasion. And there are three kinds of general tissues uh, where there are different sorts of barriers between the blood vessels and the surrounding tissue. So remember, the virus is now circulating in the blood, and how does it get across it? So here on the left, we have a situation where there's your uh, 
capillary made up of an endothelial cell. There's a nucleus of the endothelial cell. And this is surrounded by a basement membrane. And these, these endothelial cells are joined together with what we call tight junctions. And in this particular configuration, in these tissues, CNS, connective tissue, et cetera, uh, the joint between the endothelial cells is very tight and this basement membrane is very, very strong. So this is a hard thing to get out of uh, from the circulation into surrounding tissues. And not, not all viruses can do it. In the brain in particular, not all viruses can cross this, but we'll talk about it in a bit how that can happen. In some tissues, kidney, pancreas, ileum, colon, the uh, endothelial cells, there are pores at the junction. So viruses can readily get through that. And if there's, there's still a basement membrane, but if there is inflammation, the virus can get through that as well. And finally, uh, in some tissues, liver, spleen, et cetera, the blood vessel is not so much a vessel, but a sinusoid. It's just a loose collection of endothelial cells abutted to the uh, cells in the tissue. If this were liver, it would be hepatocytes. And viruses easily get past them. And that's probably because the liver is a filtration system where many things go to be detoxified. The downside is that viruses can readily uh, cross these sinusoids and get in. So we have different levels of difficulty getting from the circulation uh, into the surrounding tissue. Now in the brain, there's a specialized structure. We call it the blood, I call it the blood-brain junction. Many people call it the blood-brain <laughs> barrier, but it's not a barrier because things can get through it. It's, it's just selectively permeable. Um, but here's a capillary in the brain, and that capillary is made up of endothelial cells. You can see three of them there. And they're the junctions between the endothelial cells, and they're proteins that make it tight. You know, in some tissues it's tight, like in the CNS and others it's looser. This junction, by the way, is very complicated. And there on the right is an actual picture of some of the protein components of a tight junction in the, in the endothelial junction in the brain from a publication. You can see there are lots of proteins which cross the two plasma membranes and make this a tight junction. So that's a primary barrier that uh, astrocyte, uh, sorry, the endothelial cell has a very tight junction, has a basement membrane around it, and then on top of that, there's an astrocyte, which is wrapped around the capillary, which is part of the junction or the barrier. It prevents things from getting in, including viruses, but viruses can get around this. So in the brain and spinal cord in particular, we have quite an elaborate uh, way of protecting the tissues from things that are circulating in the blood. Nevertheless, viruses can get into the CNS. Uh, on the left is a cartoon of a capillary uh, in the CNS. And we're showing the different ways that viruses can get from the lumen of the capillary into the surrounding tissue. Again, tight junctions on the endothelial cells, a good basement membrane. Uh, some viruses sneak through in immune cells. Immune cells have the amazing ability to traffic from the lumen through the junctions of the endothelium, through the basement membrane, into the surrounding tissues. They have to. That's their job, to go in there and take care of trouble. But viruses that infect them can go along with that. Some viruses can transcytose. They bind to receptors on the inner surface of the endothelial cell, taken up in vesicles, and then deposited on the other side. And other viruses can reproduce, actually, in these cells uh, and be released as well. So a, a number of viruses are able to get from the capillary circulation in the brain into the surrounding tissue. So here on the right is an overview of the brain, and it kind of summarizes all the ways viruses can get in. They could get in from peripheral nerves, as I've told you, sensory or motor endings. Uh, they can get in from blood vessels in different parts of the brain, the cerebrum, the meninges, the choroid plexus. And there, as I, as I said, the choroid plexus, where most of the CSF is made, is, is lined with uh, only a single layer of cells. So that's a good way for viruses to get into the brain proper as well. And so a number of viruses can in fact do this, but the vast majority are blocked from getting in. Now, I will tell you later that the viruses getting in the brain, in my view, is a dead end. It's a one-way street in people because we don't eat each other, but animals eat each other and they eat the brain of an infected animal. They can pick up an infection. In us, 
uh, entry into the CNS of a virus. Brain, spinal cord is a dead end. It's an evolutionary dead end because it cannot get out. There is no selection pressure for a virus to go in the CNS because the main selection of viruses is to find a new host. And whatever needs to change to do that will be selected for. But if you go in the brain or the spinal cord, that's the end of the story. And so you will see in your future years when a new virus emerges that has the ability to infect the CNS. Zika is a good example. All of a sudden, in 2015, we learned that it could infect neural tissue. We had never seen that before. And you, you could see the headlines, Zika has changed to be able to invade the CNS. This makes zero sense. Zero. There's, there's no selection to go in the CNS. It's a dead end. It would never be selected for. And so that's all nonsense, this, the idea that a virus would evolve to infect the CNS. That's a pet peeve of mine, so we'll come back to it for sure. <laughs> all right, so virus gets out of the blood vessels into surrounding tissue, but most viruses don't replicate in every tissue they, they enter. Uh, what determines whether a virus is going to replicate in tissues? Well, one of them is uh, the receptor, and, and tissue tropism simply means what tissues a virus will grow in. So we talk about enterotropic, neurotropic, or hepatotropic viruses if they only replicate in those tissues. Some viruses have limited tropism. They only replicate in the liver. Others will replicate in every tissue. And some determinants do include the receptor, which we've touched on earlier, which would be susceptibility, permissivity. Even if the virus could get into a cell, maybe the internal environment is not suitable for replication. Some tissues are not accessible. Some tissues have active defenses that prevent infection. So there are lots of ways that we understand that viruses won't replicate in every tissue. There's one determinant I want to tell you about, one determinant of tropism, which we've mentioned briefly before. And this is the tropism of influenza virus for the respiratory tract. Most human strains of influenza virus enter your respiratory tract, replicate there, and remain there. They don't go elsewhere. And we think the reason is, is that the protease that's required for cleavage of the hemagglutinin, here on the top is the HA molecule in red, it needs to be cleaved to expose the fusion peptide. The protease, we think, these little Pac-Man thingies here, tryptase, we think it's restricted to the respiratory tract. So the virus is cleaved in the respiratory tract, can reinfect respiratory cells, and if the virus happened to get in circulation and infect your liver, it wouldn't, the virus produced would be not infectious because there's no protease to cleave the HA. So we think the HA is a determinant of the tropism, the cleavage of the HA. Now there are some avian influenza virus strains called H5N1 strains in birds that can be highly pathogenic and they infect many organs. And some of these have infected humans uh, and they're quite lethal. And these strains have a cleavage site which is recognized by a ubiquitous protease called furin. So this protease is in every tissue, not just the lung. And so these viruses have the ability to replicate in kidney and liver and intestine and so forth because the cleavage site in those viruses is different from the human strains and it can be cleaved by a protease that's found in a lot of different human tissues. So it's a good example of how tropism can be regulated by a protease. Uh, and that brings us to our next question, which is, insert, uh, so insertion of multiple basic amino acids at the HA cleavage site allows influenza virus to infect many organs. This means that the what of the virus has changed. Susceptibility, uh, club cell tryptase, that's the enzyme that cleaves the HA. Permissivity, tropism, or all of the above. So the answer is tropism most of you got. So we have changed the tropism of influenza virus by inserting a new cleavage site in the HA that can now be cleaved by furins, which are found in many tissues, not just the lung. All right, this means that the tropism of the virus has changed. Susceptibility is not right. Susceptibility is something we refer to the cell, the cell being susceptible to infection. Let's move on to the later stages of infection. And a really important one, the virus needs to leave that infected host and find a new one. 
Otherwise, as I said initially, that's the end for that virus if it can't sustain itself in a population. So it needs to be transmitted, which means the spread of infection from one host to another. And you always have to maintain it maintain a chain of infection, otherwise the virus has gone. We have two general patterns. We have transmission among the same host from host to host. So here we have two humans, and they're transmitting the virus directly to one another. Influenza virus, uh, rhinoviruses, HIV, human to human spread maintains the chain of transmission. It, it could be cows or pigs or Anything else, it doesn't have to be humans, but it's just from one organism to another directly. Organism to organism. Then the other one is through a vector. It's shown on the right. And here we have a rodent which is being bitten by a tick, and that tick has virus in it, and it will spread the virus from uh, rodent to rodent. So we have tick, rodent, then another tick will bite the rodent, pick up virus, and spread it to another. So here it's not direct spread from one mouse to another, it's mouse, tick, mouse, tick, mouse, all right? And we have many human infections that have that pattern as well, you know, human, mosquito, human, mosquito. So two general patterns of infection, human to human or vectored. And again, we have transmission terms that I use and I want you to know what they mean. So horizontal transmission means transmission between members of the same species, horizontal transmission. If we get a virus from eating bush meat, say you find a bat in the woods and you eat it and you get infected, that's not horizontal transmission because the bat is not the same species as you. That's zoonotic transmission from a different species. And we'll talk about zoonotic transmission later. Vertical is from mother to child. And in previous years, people say, what about fathers? Nope. Sorry, it's just mother to child. That's vertical transmission. A father can give infections to his child, but it's not vertical transmission. It's just mother. And here's an example of these two terms using, uh, I guess it's a sheep. Not quite sure. Here's horizontal transmission among the sheep on top, and vertical, the female sheep are having uh, offspring and they're um, spreading it to their child, so that's vertical. Then we have iatrogenic. If a healthcare worker infects you, if they use a contaminated needle and give you an infection by that needle, and that can happen anywhere, and you'd be amazed at how often this happens still in the world because not everyone has access to clean needles or disposable needles. Many people reuse uh, glass, uh, glass syringes and needles, and I'll tell you later many stories of uh, infections being spread that way. So that's iatrogenic. Nosocomial is when you get infected in a hospital or in a healthcare facility. You know, these days we're trying to keep hospital stays to a minimum, and one of the reasons is the longer you stay, the more likely you're going to get a nosocomial infection and die, and they would rather not do that. So they send you home as quickly as possible. And then we have germline transmitted, transmission, where the agent goes with the genome, like endogenous retroviruses. Now, the ones we have, we transmit to our offspring. And of course, human endogenous retroviruses don't make infectious particles, but in other animals they do, and so that's part of transmission. The other aspect of transmission is where the virus is shed. And that can depend in part on what kind of virus it is. So let's say you have a respiratory infection. You're going to be shedding virus in your mucosal secretions, in your mucus. You're going to be sneezing and coughing and expelling droplets that contain viruses in them. Um, you can have skin lesions as a consequence of even a respiratory infection. Measles begins as a respiratory infection. It causes lesions, which can have virus in it. Um, urine, semen, feces can all carry virus. Many Virus infections are transmitted uh, by sexual activity and by fecal-oral transmission. And uh, then we have uh, the blood, the blood supply. So here, technically, we're not shedding, right? Because you're getting a pint of blood from someone who is infected, and you're getting it inadvertently, not through shedding. Insect vectors can also transmit infections, germline and vertical, as I've said before. So insect vectors, again, you're not shedding, but you have virus in the blood. 
Um, and germline, of course, you're not shedding. It's being spread as part of your genome. So shedding is important for transmission of many infections, but it's not the only way an infection can be transmitted. There are non-shedding ways as well. And uh, of course, when you sneeze or cough, or actually just talk, just talking makes an aerosol. So here we have a side photograph of someone sneezing. And these droplets, you can see that when you sneeze, you make droplets of different sizes. Some of them are really big, and they fall at your feet. So they don't really have the potential to infect anyone. They're full of virus, many, many virus particles uh, in these droplets. And the very small ones can float long distances. And here's a picture of that. We have names for each of these, large infectious droplets, small, and infectious droplet nuclei. So the, the droplets can evaporate. Some of the water will evaporate and make very, very small droplets, which can travel from me to the back of the room. I could potentially infect you back there just by talking. So this is a main source of virus shedding. So even if you're, you're infected and you're not coughing or sneezing, but if you're talking, you have the potential to uh, shed virus. And of course, nasal secretions, contaminated hand, uh, doorknobs, if people are putting their fingers in their nose and touching doorknobs or public surfaces. Those are all ways that viruses can be transmitted. In fact, years ago, uh, they used to do rhinovirus transmission experiments in people. It's a relatively benign infection, so you could actually infect people. They would put people in a room and have one infected person, and then they would play cards and just sitting at that table, the combination of the contaminated cards and the speaking and exhaling virus was enough to transmit uh, the infection to others. Turns out that viruses last on money also, paper money. Uh, they did a study in Switzerland years ago. Where else would they have enough money to <laughs> do this experiment? They pipetted, uh, I think it was rhinovirus, onto Swiss banknotes and see how long it lasted. And if you mix the virus with mucus, it would last up to two weeks on a banknote. So the next time someone hands you a, a dollar, you know, don't put your eyes, your hands immediately in your eyes or your nose. Go wash them first. In fact, that's the best way to not pick up viruses if you're touching things in the outside world. Keep your hands away from your mucosal surfaces until you can wash them. Here's an interesting study done uh, not too long ago. There's the reference. <laughs> this machine is called Gesundheit 2. And this is a study done at University of Maryland, where they got uh, college students, and they recruited them and paid them to put their face in this thing, and 156 of them with confirmed influenza. And they just sat there, and they, re they made them say the alphabet to see how much virus was produced by talking. And then every time they sneezed or coughed, then they would measure the virus coming out of them. And what, what they found is that uh, most of the virus is shed by the fine aerosols produced by breathing and speaking. But sneezing does not make an important contribution, and coughing isn't even necessary. And so I said earlier, you know, the CDC always tells you to sneeze into your arm, but for flu, at least, in this study, it doesn't contribute most. It's mostly talking that does that. They had to sit here for 30 minutes. I hope they paid them well. Uh, the other way virus can be transmitted is from skin lesions. Um, so we no longer immunize the general population against smallpox because the virus was eradicated. We only immunize the military and healthcare workers. And as we'll see later, when you get immunized, they scrape the vi vaccine into your arm, your deltoid, just the surface of the skin. You get a very nice blister forming. When they give you the vaccine, they put a Band-Aid on it, and they say, don't take it off because you're contagious for two weeks. But people do take it off, and they interact with other people. So uh, the, here on the top is the, uh, the progression of the lesion. That's the vaccine site. That's what the lesion looks like. And in fact, I have a scar still from the vaccination for smallpox I got as a kid because I was vaccinated when we were still uh, uh, using the vaccine. And so you have a lifelong scar. But these are just two uh, examples of military uh, vaccinees who had contact, sexual contact in both cases, and they transmitted the vaccine virus to their partner through shedding from this lesion. And I'll leave it to you to figure out where on their partner this went, because it likes, this virus likes mucosal surfaces. 
And it's a very painful infection when it happens. So they told these individuals, don't take off the Band-Aid, don't contact anyone for two weeks, but they didn't listen, which is, it's human behavior, right? And so <laughs> they, they transmitted this infection. And I, I want to end up by talking a little bit about some other factors that can regulate infection, and these include geography and season. These are known to influence when infections occur. So geography, I think, makes sense because sometimes you need a specific vector to transmit the virus, or there's a reservoir in an animal that's only in certain places. And so, for example, um, here on the lower left is the range of one mosquito Aedes aegypti in the US. And you can see, so the southern states, the warm states, are more, more likely to have Aedes aegypti, and you're more likely to have uh, infections transmitted. Interestingly, so Zika virus is transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Only two places in the US where we have had local mosquito-borne transmission of Zika, and that's in Brownsville, Texas, right south on the Mexican border, and um, Miami. There's the two southernmost points where Aedes are known to be, and they have the climate and the conditions for transmission. And on the right is a different mosquito, Aedes albopictus. You can see it has a different range. So depending on where the vector is, just so one example, can control where the virus is going to be. I'll give you an example of this, and that is an interesting virus called chikungunya virus. Uh, this is a family uh, called the toga viruses where we haven't talked very much about. They're envelope viruses with a plus-stranded RNA genome. They're mosquito-borne uh, viruses, and chikungunya can cause a, it's an ar arthritogenic virus. It causes arthritis, rash, fever, and joint pain. This virus historically has, was found in, in Asia, Africa, but never in, the Euro in Europe or the US. And you can see the blue shows you the known range of this disease, mainly because of the range of the vector, Aedes aegypti. Well, in 2004, uh, outbreaks began to spread um, and the, actually there was a very big one initially on Réunion Island and from there it spread to Europe and you can see it spread throughout Europe, Scandinavia and Australia as well. So a number of years ago, 2004, the virus range expanded. So what happened? Well, it turned out that a new host for the, vi for the virus uh, emerged and that is Aedes albopictus. The virus could replicate in Aedes albopictus before, but didn't replicate very well. And so it wasn't vectored by that mosquito. It was mainly Aedes aegypti. But uh, the virus glycoprotein, one amino acid of the virus glycoprotein changed. And that now let it replicate really well in Aedes albopictus. And so all those new outbreaks were where Aedes albopictus is found. And so that explains the expanded range of the virus having been able to replicate efficiently in a new mosquito vector. So in the US, um, this is the range on the right here for Aedes albopictus. So it can go as far north as uh, New Jersey and New York. Um, on the left are the cases of chikungunya in the US, most likely vectored by Aedes albopictus. You have a lot of travel associated cases uh, which, which means the virus is being imported from someone who's gone to a place where the virus is present. And we've had 114 cases, but no local transmission yet. But it's probably only a matter of time because the virus can replicate in Aedes albopictus. And the range of this mosquito is increasing as, as global warming proceeds. Here are some temperature maps of Europe from pre-2011 to, these are predicted numbers. You can see the red, the increasing temperatures. And as temperatures rise globally, mosquito population ranges change. They can go to different places, and eventually, maybe all of the US will have Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. It's one of the real consequences of uh, climate change. And finally, many virus infections are seasonal. They only occur at certain times of the year. So on the upper left, rubella, before vaccination, you could see Every year, a peak in the summer of rubella. Here on the bottom, influenza, we know to be a winter disease in temperate climates like ours. And poliomyelitis was seasonal. Here in our particular 
uh, latitude. Um, well, it's not on here, but polio was seasonal and mostly occurred in the summer. Um, but in other latitudes, it, it occurred at different times. So what is causing this seasonality? In some cases, we know that temperature and humidity can regulate the transmission of virus. So if virus is transmitted by aerosols, they can affect the infectivity of the virus. The outdoor activity of hosts can also influence seasonality. But really, for the most part, we really don't understand how seasonality impacts virus infection. So next time, we will continue this discussion of pathogenesis by moving into the initial defenses of the host against uh, virus infection. Mm -hmm.